Good. Right. Um, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. As Ed says, I'm Peter Stone from Newcastle. And I go by the very grand title at the moment of um, UNESCO Chair in Cultural Property Protection and Peace, which is a mouthful if, um, if ever there was. But what um, it reflects is the issue that we're, we're talking about, um, trying to protect cultural property during um, armed conflict. And you'll see two logos or a number of logos on. Um, the one on the left, as you look at it, is my UNESCO chair logo. Um, the one in the middle is the logo of the organisation I'm going to be talking about mostly, um, the Blue Shield. Um, and I start this journey back in 2003 when I got a um, very late, as in um, a few days before, a couple of weeks before the invasion of Iraq, um, uh, conversation around is there some archaeology in Iraq that we the Ministry of Defence targeting, targeting an operations directorate should be taking into account um, okay um, and so I took a decision well I had a decision to take in sort of summer of 2003 which went along the lines of um, and if I'm being recorded I'll try not to swear too much but oh dear that was so appalling I want nothing ever to do with that again or that was so appalling, I can't believe we can't do better. And for some daft reason, I took the last, and I've been banging my head against a brick wall for the last, whatever it is, some um, 16, 17 years now. On the uh, slide are a number of lessons that I think I've learned, or at least identified, um, and that we as a heritage community, um, and it's broader than archaeology, a point I'll come to in a minute, um, need also to have learnt and take on board. Um, we need not to talk about objects and sites and things before we talk about people. Absolutely critical. We need to work with the military at a whole variety of different levels. We need to understand the constraints under which they work and the priorities that they have. And we can't, as we did in 2002 and 2003, shout at them saying, you've done a terrible thing because that will just put them into a, um, a little bubble and they will never talk to us again. Um, we need to get them to understand our priorities and try to work with them to um, pull those sets of different priorities together. This is an astonishingly topical um, discussion to have. Um, less than a month ago, the UN Security Council passed for the first time a unanimous resolution about the protection of cultural heritage. It's a pity they missed out the one paragraph which would have been really useful to have, from my point of view, which is reminding all state parties of their military's obligations um, during armed conflict. But hey, you can't have it all. Um, and the organisation I want to talk about, um, as I say, is the Blue Shield. Established in 1996, but the emblem mentioned was a doodle by a Polish professor um, during the conference um, setting up the Blue Shield in 1954. Um, set up in 1996 in anticipation of the second protocol for the 1954 Hague Convention, the primary piece of international legislation protecting cultural property during armed conflict. Um, and then uh, reconfigured, and I won't bore you with all of the detail, if anybody is an insomniac, I can explain to them over the next uh, whatever um, as to why the organisation has changed a couple of times, but we are now simply the Blue Shield. We work within the context of, of Hague and of the UN and UNESCO's global strategies about dealing with this, and interestingly, the UN's resolution a month ago was not about... Um, it wasn't entitled Protecting Cultural Heritage, it was security and um, something else, uh, protection and security. Um, it's all cultural property, not just archaeology, books, libraries, archives, the whole caboodle. Intangible as well. Keep going back to the people. We are a non-governmental, non-profit, um, luckily because we have no money, entirely voluntary, independent and supposedly <coughs> impartial, neutral um, organisation. And... We are really international and we have made inroads and this is a colleague um, from the Cambodian um, Army's Cultural Property Protection Unit, mainly of retired officers but great people to have because they know exactly 
all of the issues that the military face and they can then go in and start to mitigate um, around cultural property protection. We have six areas of policy, all of which could take an hour or more to talk about. Um, and I'm going to do all six in the next 15 minutes or so. Um, but very briefly, we look at um, developing policy and what we're calling a blue shield approach to CPP. Coordination, proactive protection, you can read them. I, I will go through them all um, in a moment. But just before I start going through those, why is protecting cultural property important? And there are a whole myriad of answers to that and subsets and sub-answers to that. Um, if we spent the day asking everybody in the room, we would come up with yet another list of very <coughs> valuable and very important and very real reasons for protecting cultural property. The point of putting this up is that, in a way, the top two are the least important in terms of protecting cultural property during conflict and they get more important as you go down the list. Now that's a simplistic reading of that slide but it's roughly um, correct. Okay? If you go as I did in 2003 to the military and say you must protect Babylon, it is a world heritage site, they smile at you um, usually pat you on the head because they're usually much taller um, and say thank you and that's the door, um, Dr Stone. If you phrase it at the bottom end of that list, they begin to say, okay, would you like to sit down? And if you actually get to the bottom one of those, they actually say, would you like a cup of tea? <laughs> so why is CPP important to the military? Initially, the military would immediately say it's not. Protecting culture is not part of our job. Our job is to go in at the behest of politicians to win a conflict and to deliver what the politicians want as the end result of that conflict. That's our job, that's in military, our mission, and that's what we're going to do. Now, the only way that they will take on board the protection of cultural property within that mission is if it is an enabler of that mission. In other words, if it helps them deliver their end result. The first way of grabbing them, um, no, I'm being filmed, of grabbing their attention <laughs> is by saying it's international law and you have a responsibility under international law to do this. It is even better as I stand here um, on whatever it is, the 20th of April, because on the 23rd of February, finally, only 62 years late, the UK passed internal legislation to enable us to ratify the 1954 Hague Convention and both its protocols. We will, um, I hope, next week, but it's not clear yet, but I think next week, we will formally have ratified the convention, which comes into, therefore, operation three months later. We will be the last of the permanent five of the UN to have ratified the convention, but we were nearly the first to have ratified the convention and both its protocols. The French got there last week. <laughs> Quite so. <laughs> Okay, it's, but we now have clear responsibility, clear legal responsibility under international humanitarian law that this is what we have to do. It was there before under international customary law and it is now, thanks to the UN Special Rapporteur on Cultural Rights, a post I didn't know existed until last year, um, increasingly becoming part of international human rights law. So there's no way out for the military, they have got to deal with this. Secondly, the political use of cultural property is key and important for them because it's the politicians who send them to war and say, OK, this war has now ended. Okay? It's not the military who make either of those decisions. The economic value of cultural property enables the military to get out of what they call theatre, a country, um, quicker if there is an economic stability to that country. If that country relies... 60-70% on cultural tourism 
And if the military have allowed lots of that cultural, to uh, cultural property to be blown up, destroyed or damaged, then the economic basis is significantly weakened and they may be caught in theatre for longer and two things happen when your troops are in theatre for longer. One, they get bored and frustrated and leave the service. Their families put a huge amount of pressure on them. And two, they also tend to get killed. And that's certainly, neither of those are what the military top brass want. So that's a, a good thing. Increasingly, there is an issue around funding for the opposition and, and looting of sites. So I won't go into that. Post-conflict stabilisation, the catastrophe of Iraq was um, fanned by the destruction of religious sites from different communities by different communities in a tit-for-tat destruction. And um, a colleague, ben, uh, Ishikan from Australia, has done some absolutely fantastic work on identifying days when cultural property was destroyed and then the spike of human death immediately following. Um, and that's very convincing. Um, and then the whole concept of soft power, doing things well and therefore not causing yourself problems or doing things badly and therefore causing yourself problems. And unfortunately, there are far too many examples of the latter and very few of the former. I can talk more about those. So in the first area of what we try and do as Blue Shield is policy development. And one of the things I wrote, and it took me a long time just to get to this very simplistic agenda, um, of the four times that people from our sector need to engage with the military. Long term, everybody in uniform needs to know an extremist that protecting of cultural property can save their life. Immediately pre-deployment, what's the heritage like that they're going to? Um, who may be able to help them protect it? During conflict, there needs to be somebody in uniform on the um, shoulder of the commanding officer saying, sir, is this military necessity or convenience? Because if it's the latter, both technical terms in military speak, if it's the latter, then we shouldn't be doing it. Okay? But that's somebody, the only person who can do that is somebody in uniform in a relevant HQ. And then post-conflict stabilisation, when they're the only act in town who may have the heavy lifting equipment or the chemicals or the whatever um, to help um, with that. That article was um, first published in Antiquity in 2013, in March. In December, it was republished in um, what the military interestingly called the Thinking Officers Journal, the um, uh, British Army Review. Um, and in January, I got a phone call um, out of the blue and the voice at the other end said, um, Prof Stone, you don't know me, but I'm from Army HQ and we need to speak. And from that, the Army set up a cultural property protection working group, which has morphed into a joint service um, working group. And MOD sent the letter just before Christmas saying that, yes, there will be a new CPP unit um, created in the British Armed Forces, um, which we anticipate will happen um, in the next um, six months or so. Get real, it's war. Things are going to be destroyed and blown up and there's nothing that could be done about it. Actually, if you begin to think about how and why things are put at risk, there are seven risks, and I'm not going to be able to go through these in any detail, but there are seven different risks for cultural property, all of which can be mitigated for to one degree or another. And if you do that for all seven, you obviously lower the overall risk to cultural property. And that's something that we should be doing. And these are elements of what I'm talking about as the Blue Shield um, approach. Coordination, the second area we do with, um, within Blue Shield, within Heritage, with those in uniform. Coordination, just one example. It took me, whatever it was, six, seven years to work with the NATO-affiliated Civilian Military Centre of Excellence to get them to write this book called CPP Makes Sense. They wanted me to write it in the first instance, and I said, no, there's going to be no point in Prof Stone from somewhere writing it. It has to be written by people in uniform for people in uniform, and as a result become much more used and much more effective. 
We have, um, over the last few years, unfortunately, given lists of cultural property we would protect, we would prefer not to be destroyed um, for a number of countries, including Libya. And um, targeteers who were um, decided to target the next day um, a group of six Iraqi, sorry, Iraqi Libyan um, uh, vehicles of a mobile radar unit um, from tro troops loyal to President Gaddafi, um, who put these things inside and next to a large building. Um, luckily, the large building flashed, or the coordinates of the building flashed on the targeted screen as the same coordinates for a Roman building that we'd given them. The military, in military parlance, modified the ordinance. And so instead of dropping one very big bomb that would have blown up all six and the building, they used precision weaponry, which increased the cost of the operation by more than sixfold, but destroyed all six of the vehicles and left the Roman building intact. On the back of that, NATO suddenly got a lot of good publicity, which is something that they were very unused to. They therefore, <laughs> they therefore set up an internal review, which reported in December of 2012, which said that NATO should develop its own CPP strategy. Um, and that process is still going on. <laughs> We're trying to do a lot of training and capacity building built around all of those things that I've, I've said to you. Um, but critically, the fourth bullet point, how this damage might be avoided without compromising the mission. Because if you do anything other than that, then you won't be listened to. We've got an awful long way to go with emergency response. We have put people into areas that I think are far too dangerous, far too quickly, and with, far, uh, with no real support. And I have a lot of sleepless nights when they're overseas. But they have done fantastic work and took, for example, that photograph at Ras al Margheb, which is now why NATO are developing that policy. Um, and then finally, the post-disaster recovery and long support, a, a combination of all of the work that I've talked about um, or sketched out above, um, but also terms of um, sharing good practice, publicity, general advocacy, talking to groups like this, talking to groups of librarians, um, archivists, the general public. Um, I did, just to point out how um, topical this is, as I said in the second one, I received, um, I think it was 12 invitations to speak in seven countries um, for the period of three months or so before Christmas of last year. And I did a bizarre nine-week, seven-country, 18-flight trip talk, talking about this because this is what everybody is engaged with at the moment. This is what everybody wants to try and deliver. It is being talked about at UNESCO's executive board again next week. And we hope that there will be some significant developments over the next six months or so in turning what is, as I say at the moment, an entirely voluntary organisation with no central office or anything. Blue Shield Central Office is at the moment room 307 on the third floor of the Armstrong building, in other words, my office, um, and with no capacity to um, an efficient or more efficient um, organisation that can deliver. Just as an aside, because I promised my boss I would do this, the people who have given most to Blue Shield um, in all of its existence is in fact Newcastle University by giving me two lots of 10,000 travel money um, to get around. Um, we need to do better than that. We don't need to leave it to one university to deal with it. Um, and if anybody would like me to translate anything I've said far too quickly into anything that makes sense, um, then please uh, do ask me either um, in a formal session or catch me afterwards. Thank you very much for listening.